I'm Brittany Brinkley, a senior at DM Thera High School of Health Sciences and Research. Welcome to Inside APS. And I'm David Kane, a senior at DM Thera High School of Technology, Engineering, Mathematics, and Science. Today we have a very special program at the 12th Annual Lowry Lecture Series on Civic Engagement. Followed by interviews with Dr. Lowry. Now, let's go to the program. Good, Good morning. morning. My name is Dustin Godfrey. And I am Kendria Gooch. We, we are seniors, seniors at the, the DM Thera, Thera High School, School of Law, Law Government, Government, and Public, Public Policy. <laughs> to Mr. Byron Amos, Vice Chair of the Atlanta Board of Education and members of the board. Superintendent Errol B. Davis, Jr., the Reverend Joseph E. Lowry, Mrs. Lowry and his special guests, the Honorable Stacey Abrams and her guests, elected officials and distinguished guests, program participants, APS officials, faculty, staff, and fellow students. Welcome to the 12th Annual Reverend Joseph E. Lowry Lecture Series on Civic Engagement House in the Reverend Joseph E. Lowry Auditorium, named in his honor during Black History Month earlier this year. We are very excited to be here with you today and to honor Reverend Lowry, who will be celebrating his 91st birthday on tomorrow. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Reverend, Reverend Lowry. Lowry. The DM Thera School of Law, Government, and Public Policy is proud to host the annual Reverend Joseph E. Lowry Lecture Series on Civic Engagement. Here to welcome you this morning is our principal, Ms. Libra Royster. Oh. Following the welcome, we will hear greetings from Mr. Byron Amos, Vice Chair of the Atlanta Board of Education and Atlanta Public Schools Superintendent Errol B. Davis, Jr. to Byron D. Amos, Vice Chair of the Atlanta Board of Education, and fellow board members, Superintendent Errol Davis, Reverend Joseph E. Lowry, Georgia Minority Leader, Stacey Abrams, Atlanta Public Schools faculty, staff, and students, and our distinguished guests. Good morning and welcome to the Daniel McLaughlin Thero High School Educational Complex. I stand representing the administration, the staff, the students of all three schools. The schools of health sciences and research led by interim principal, Ms. Shelley Powell. The school for technology, engineering, math, and science led by principal Esme Gaynor. And the school for law, government, and public policy where I serve as interim principal. While we are all three small schools on one large campus, our goal is to provide engaging environment that fosters student achievement. On this eve of the 91st birthday, we are so honored to host the Reverend Joseph E. Lowry Lecture Series on Civic Engagement. This evening would not be possible without the support of the Atlanta Board of Education, Atlanta Public Schools, and you, Reverend Lowry. Thank you for making a difference in the lives of students today and the students to come. Again, we welcome you to the D.M. Thero Educational Complex. Good morning. Oh, we could do better than that. Good morning. I bring to you greetings on behalf of the Atlanta Board of Education on this occasion on the 12th annual Reverend Joseph E. Lowry Lecture Series. This event is a great opportunity for our students to gain first-hand knowledge about leadership, civic engagement, civic involvement, and education from veterans of the field. Dr. Lowry, happy birthday, sir. You have been on the front line for many years, and we appreciate your being here with us today. Leader Abrams, we are honored to have you here as our guest lecturer this year. We know that you have, will share with our students wisdom, 
wisdom that they can use in their everyday life to make choices as they define their future. I would also like to acknowledge my fellow board members. We have board chair Ruben McDaniel, <laughs> board member um, Cicely harsh Kinney, and other elected officials are present with us today, and I see the Dean of City Council, of course your council member, C.T. Martin. Are there any other elected officials with us today? Please stand to be recognized. Okay, thank you. Opportunities such as the Lowry Lecturer support the learning process by broadening our students' minds and emphasizing the importance of building good character and giving back to the community. Students, I want you to, I want you to close this by reminding you that good citizenship is not a right but it is a responsibility of us all. Today's forum is the way for you to learn about, the become, about becoming a good citizen. Take advantage of what you will listen, what you will hear today, and listen and learn, because this is a wonderful opportunity, and you are in the presence of greatness and a history maker. Thank you, and have a good day. Good morning. I am pleased to be here today for the, of course, for the 12th annual Lowry Lecture Series. Atlanta Public Schools is very pleased and very proud to be able to host this event each year as we celebrate the life and certainly the achievements of Reverend Joseph E. Lowry. Uh, Reverend Lowry, I, I know that you and Mrs. Lowry continue uh, to be strong supporters of public education uh, and particularly the public education of the children of Atlanta and for that we are profoundly grateful. Reverend Lowry's name of course and his reputation are synonymous. They're synonymous with such words as leader, advocate, and fearlessness particularly when it comes to speaking the truth in any forum. And our guest lecturer today is someone who is known to possess many of these very same qualities. House Minority Leader Stacey Abrams is known for speaking the uncomfortable truths. Her undeniable courage and tenacity are admired by all on both sides of the legislative aisle. She continues to uphold and protect the constitutional rights of all children to receive quality educational opportunities. Representative Abrams, we are grateful to you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to share your wisdom and life lessons uh, with our students today. And I urge you students to pay attention. You're in for a rare treat. We all look forward to your remarks. Now, I know that it's still reasonably early in the school year, but I want to recognize and have stand all of the seniors of the graduating class of 2013. <laughs> Please be seated. I can, th students, I, I can think of no better way to spend a one senior year than to hear a message of inspiration and leadership from intellectuals who have actually changed this world. Seven months from now, I expect to see all of you again. I want to see you in your caps and your gowns. I want to see you as you walk across the stage of the uh, Atlanta Civic Center to receive your very hard-earned but well-deserved uh, diplomas. But as you enter this final stretch, as you think about your plans for the future, I want you to take away one thing this morning as you uh, aspire to be history makers like those you will see on stage here today. And it is that your history it, tomorrow begins today. So again, greetings to everyone, and please enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you. At this time, Jabir Donaldson from the Best Academy at Benjamin S. Carson will bring the occasion. Good morning. The Reverend Joseph E. Lowry Lecture Series on Civic Engagement is a cherished tradition for students here at Atlanta Public Schools. Since 2001, APS has hosted this occasion every year 
to celebrate the life and contributions of Reverend Lowry during his birthday. We invite guest lecturers who have excelled in their fields of expertise, including the late Maynard Holbrook Jackson, Judge Preeny Brown Reynolds, Bill Cosby, and Dr. David Satcher. And today is certainly no exception. You see, we actually get to meet America's history makers. What an honor it is to have world-class leaders who play a powerful role in shaping our learning experiences outside the four walls of a classroom. Thank you in advance to Reverend Lowry and to Leader Abrams for sharing your own invaluable life lessons. We look forward to all that you have for us today. Next, we will have Naomi Haynes from the South Atlanta School of Law and Social Justice introduce Reverend Lowry to bring his commentary. Good morning. Born in Huntsville, Alabama on October 6, 1921, the Reverend Joseph E. Lowry has been one of the nation's strongest and most consistent advocates for racial justice, human rights, and world peace. Reverend Lowry serves as a convener for the Coalition of the People's Agenda and a renowned speaker. Reverend Lowry delivered the benediction of the inauguration of the President Barack Obama as the 44th President of the United States. In August 2009, he received the nation's highest civilian award, the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Barack Obama. When Ebony Magazine named Reverend Lowry one of the nation's 15 greatest black preachers, they described him as a consummate voice of biblical social relevancy, a focused prophetic voice speaking truth to power. In 1997, the AANCP presented him with one of its most prestigious awards and called him the Dean of the Civil Rights Movement. In 1957, he joined Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Ralph David Abernathy and other Southern ministers to organize the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Reverend Lowry has served as Vice President until 1967, then Chairman of the Board until February 1977, and President and CEO until 1998. Reverend Lowry has received numerous honorary doctorates from many institutions, including Clark Atlanta University, Morehouse College, Dillard University, Alabama State University, Central State University, Payne College, Beloit College, University of Alabama at Huntsville, Miles College, and others. Reverend Lowry is also a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, participated in the fraternity's dedication of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial in Washington, D.C. in 2011. Reverend Lowry is married to Evelyn Gibson Lowry, who is the founder and chair of SCLC Women and the father of five children. On his 80th birthday, the city of Atlanta changed the name of Aspey Street to Joseph E. Lowry Boulevard. Atlanta Public Schools established the Reverend Joseph E. Lowry Lecture Series on Civic Engagement, and Clark Atlanta University founded the Joseph E. Lowry Institute for Justice and Human Rights. As he celebrates his 91st birthday on October 6th, Reverend Lowry's legacy of civil rights, social justice, and human rights will continue to have a long-lasting impact on the students of Atlanta Public Schools through his lecture series. Ladies and gentlemen, it's with our great privilege that we are ready and happy to present Reverend Joseph E. Lowry. Thank you very much. I'm delighted. I, I, uh, I can't. I don't realize this was the twelfth session of this lecture series, and I'm, I, I enjoy it more and more each year. Uh, last night, uh, the Lowry Institute, under the leadership of. My youngest daughter, Cheryl, uh, sponsored a, a debate, not the one you saw on television, a much better one, <laughs> at, uh, at uh, Clark Atlanta University last night. And they had students from uh, Spelman and Morehouse and Clark Atlanta and from the uh, ushers. Uh, what is Usher? What? 
Hush Institute, Hush or something. <laughs> and uh, any, you know Hush. Uh, and uh, students from his foundation. And they had a tremendous debate. It was, those of you who missed it, I'm sorry. It was a much better debate than the one we watched on television. Uh, those students uh, really uh, did it up. And there were guests, uh, a, a whole line of students from Zero uh, who came last night to witness the debate from uh, among those students. And that civic engagement, that's getting involved in, in the life of your community. That's recognizing that it's up to you that the level of, 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 of the quality of life in your community will be accurately measured by the level of your participation in civic affairs. If you don't get involved, the community suffers. If you get involved, the community benefits. And uh, I was so proud of those students from there. Are they here this morning? Are there any students who came? Stand up if you came to the debate last night. <laughs> Give them a hand. That's their heart. Uh, and those of you who watched the debate on television uh, witnessed the second best debate of the evening. The first debate, the best debate was by those students from Clark and Mohouse and Spelman and the Usher Foundation as they 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 they, they went into each other and they 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 worked it out. I enjoyed it. I got a lot more fun out of that one than I did the next one. Uh, the next one was good. How many of you watched the big debate on television? Oh, bless your heart. Bless, <laughs> bless your Bless your heart. Uh, I was very proud to see that there were students there. And I, I'm always uh, grateful for when I hear that some student from Thero has been involved in some important activity in our community. And the future is yours. Uh, the community will be what you help it become. And uh, your stewardship uh, is the barometer by which we measure quality of life in your community. Thank you for this lecture series. Uh, some of you were just starting in the, 12th, in the first grade when we started. And I'm very proud, I'm grateful to uh, the Board of Education, to the faculty and students here at Therrell, and to all of those who helped make this uh, a gratifying, satisfying, stimulating, rewarding experience to celebrate your involvement uh, in the community. Thank you for this 12th session. I look forward to uh, the speech from our distinguished uh, representative who's here. I want to thank Dr. Davis and everybody who's participated. It's a great thing. And just finally, let me say that, that uh, don't those of you, a lot of you watched the debate and, and some people felt that the debate wasn't as stimulating and uh, that it wasn't as the victory for uh, Mr. Obama that they expected. Well, it depends on how you measure it. Uh, I'll admit that Mr. What's his name? 
Romney uh, exceeded my expectations in terms of his performance, but not in terms of his uh, contribution. And perhaps Mr. Obama didn't quite reach up to my expectations from him because he's been so terrific. But his substance of his presentation was excellent. And I'm grateful for that. And I'm looking forward to the vice president debate and to the second debate by the presidential candidates. And, and congratulations to you that you sat and listened and, 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 and try to understand their perspective because they are the, one of those who will lead our, our country for the next four years. But you will carry the banner of Theral and Atlanta and your hopes and dreams for the next four years and the next many years. And when I've uh, moved on to that home in the sky, I want you to know I'm going every now and then uh, steal a peek around a cloud to see how you're doing at Thera. And I know you're going to be doing great. Can I get an amen? amen. Thank you. Stacey Y. Abrams is the House Minority Leader for the Georgia General Assembly and State Representative for the 84th House District. She is the first woman to lead either party in the Georgia General Assembly and is the first African American to lead the House of Representatives. Stacey serves on the following committees, Appropriations, Ethics, Judiciary, Non-Civil, Rules and Ways and Means. She co-founded and acts as Senior Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer of Now Account Network Corporation, a financial services firm. Stacy also co-founded Nourish Inc., a beverage company with a focus on infants and toddlers, and is a partner in other entrepreneurial ventures. Formerly, Stacy was Deputy City Attorney for the City of Atlanta. Prior to her city tenure at the city, she was special tax counsel at the Sutherland Asbill and Brent Brennan Law Firm in Atlanta. In 2012, Stacy was recognized as one of 2012's rising legislators to watch by Governing Magazine and one of the 100 most influential Georgians by Georgia Trend. She has been honored as Legislator of the Year by the Georgia Alliance Community Hospitals, as Public Servant of the Year by the Georgia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and has received Legislative Service Awards from the Georgia Municipal Association, the Association County Commissioners Georgia, the DeKalb County Chamber of Commerce, and the Georgia Conservation Voters. Stacy is a former term member of the Council on Foreign Relations and is an alumnus of Leadership Georgia, Leadership Atlanta, and the Regional Leadership Institute. Stacy has published articles on issues of public policy, taxation, and nonprofit organizations, including pieces with the American Prospect, the Christian Science Monitor, Yale Law and Policy Review, U.S. News and World Report, and the Southern University Law Review. She has taught courses on law and social policy at Yale University and Spelman College. Under the pen name Selena Montgomery, Stacy is the award-winning author of eight romantic suspense novels, which have sold more than 100,000 copies. Stacy currently serves on the Board of Trustees for St. Joseph Health System and Agnes Scott College, the Board of Directors for the Gateway Center for the Homeless, and the advisory boards of the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University, Literary Action, and others. She received her JD from the Yale School of Law, her MPAFF in Public Policy from the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin, and her BA in Interdisciplinary Studies, Political Science, Economics, and Sociology from Spelman College, Magna Cum Laude. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honorable Stacy Y. Abel.
Good morning. Well, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Dr. Lowry for allowing me to be number 12 uh, in your lecture series. Um, you guys need to start raising your bar. Um, going back the other way, because following Jeanetta Cole and Bill Cosby and Maynard Jackson, uh, you, know, you might want to stop. Yeah. Um, I also want to say thank you to someone who I see everywhere, um, but who I don't think gets enough recognition for her decision to loan us Dr. Lowry for so many years. Join me in thanking Evelyn Lowry. <laughs> so I, I recognize that I'm speaking to a mixed crowd of, of students and teachers, parents and friends, uh, and I'm going to let anybody over the age of 18 eavesdrop, but I'm not talking to you. Um, I'm talking to the students, and I want to talk to you about civic engagement in a very specific way. We hear a lot about civic engagement. We're hearing a lot about running for office, a lot about politics. But sometimes it's hard to remember why it matters. Why do you have to listen to this conversation? And so I'm going to have a conversation with you and let them eavesdrop. Uh, particularly Superintendent Davis and your principals, because I'm going to tell you all to do some stuff they're not going to like. Um, so y'all can just you know, do plausible deniability and say you didn't hear me say it later on when you do it. Uh, I, I grew up in southern Mississippi. My parents are from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I'm the second of six children. And I was on the phone with my mother on my way here because I wanted to fact check a story I wanted to tell and I need to make sure it was true. Uh, as you noticed recently, there are a lot of politicians who stand up and say things, and then when you bother to look it up, you realize they weren't telling the exact truth. Um, read or watch the debates again if you want to understand more. I believe in telling the truth, even if the truth is uncomfortable, and I learned that from my parents. Because uh, my parents lived in a time, they grew up in southern Mississippi in the 1950s and 60s. They grew up knowing what it meant to go to segregated high schools, to go to whites-only bathrooms. They understood what it meant to dream of going to college, only to know that that dream would probably not be realized because their families had never made enough money to make it true. My dad was the first person in his family to ever graduate from high school and go to college. My mother is the only person in her family who finished high school. In fact, she didn't finish first through third grades because she kept coming in and out of school because her parents couldn't make enough money to keep them stable. But my mother and my father, when they married, decided that they were going to be different than the world that they inherited. They were going to build a family that made education the center of who we are. And they did so because they understood that education was the one thing that they could have that no one could take away from them. You can lose a job, you can lose a house, you can lose a car, but you can't lose what you learn. Now, my parents also decided that they were going to populate the earth, so they had six children. I'm number two. And unfortunately, my parents did not decide that they were going to be millionaires. So unlike uh, Mr. Romney, I can't borrow money from my parents. My parents still owe, I think, everyone they've ever met. But my parents did. I, I apologize. I'm a tiny bit partisan, but that's part of my job. Uh, but what my parents did understand was that there, there were values that they could give us that were richer than any money we could have. My parents understood that, that going to church was going to ground our souls, that going to school was going to enrich our minds, and that working and serving other was going to enlarge our hearts. And so we spent Monday through Friday at school, Saturday working in a soup kitchen or at a homeless shelter, and Sunday in church. Uh, and that was before my became, parents became ministers, and then we started going to church almost every single day, which you know, I'll talk about that later. Uh, but during that time, what my parents were, were, con were consistent about was that we had to serve people on Saturdays. That, that day was not a day of just hanging out and watching cartoons or going to play or hanging out with your friends. That was the day we had to go serve other people. And it used to perplex us as children because my parents didn't make any money. Uh, we were what they now call the working poor. Back then we were just poor. Uh, my parents both worked full-time jobs. My dad also cut trees to make some extra money. He worked double shifts. Uh, my mother made less than the janitor who worked at the college where she was the head librarian. Uh, but my parents didn't let that stop them because what they told us is you may not have the clothes that you want, but we're going to go to a homeless shelter so you can see someone who doesn't have clothing that they need. 
You may not get to eat the food you want, but you're going to work in a soup kitchen so you understand what hunger feels like. You may not get to play the games and go out with your friends, but we're going to go to a juvenile justice center so you see children who don't have freedom. Because my parents believed that no matter how little we had, there was someone with less. And our obligation on this earth was to serve those people. Now, when you're 16 or 17, that just sounds like punishment. But when you're older, you start to realize that what my parents did was remind me that everything I have, I owe to someone else, and that everything I do, I do because I must. I grew up with a family that understood the value of service and that service wasn't simply lip service. It was something you had to do and live. Now, as I told you, both of my parents are ministers. Uh, at the age of 40, I was a junior in high school. I was 15. My parents had turned 40, and they decided that they were going to become Methodist ministers. And as Dr. Lowry can tell you, they did that because they, weren't, they were making too much money, so they decided to you know, make as little money as possible and go and preach to poor people. So my parents quit their jobs. We moved from Mississippi to Atlanta so they could go to Candler at, the, at Emory University and get Masters of Divinity and then move back to Mississippi, where, I kid you not, they make less money than they did before they went to school. But they are richer because the people they serve need them. And I watched my parents make the hard choice to learn again. Imagine not going to school for 20 years and then deciding you're going to go back to school. And not by yourself, but with five children in tow. My older sister had just started college, but the rest of us were still in elementary school or high school. So I saw my parents decide to do that, and, and, and that was the moment where I understood not only why they thought education was so important, but why civic engagement was so important. My parents understood in a fundamental way that the people of Mississippi needed someone. They needed people who could stand up for them. And while they had Christ in their hearts, they needed knowledge in their minds to do that job. And that's why you're in the school. I, I wish Theral had been around when I was in high school. I, I, I can't imagine what I'd be if I'd gone to school here. But what, what I learned from my parents watching them struggle through school was that you don't have the luxury of whining about your life. My parents worked full time, went to school full time, and had six kids full time. And that was a lot of work. But what I took from that is, is what I'm going to talk to you about now, and, and that's why civic engagement matters. It matters because it allows you to change the world you see. It's as simple as that. And, and there's, a, there's a, a tendency for those of us who are younger, and, and I don't put myself quite in your category anymore, but we tend to think that the world should be better and somebody else should do it. But if you don't like what's happening to you, you are responsible for changing that. Because you have to be the conscience for those who came before you. I'm 38 years old. I don't remember what it's like to be 16. I vaguely recall 25. But that means that I don't always remember the hardships, the things that bother us, the things that make your lives difficult. But more importantly, those of you in this audience are responsible for being the voices of those who come behind you. Those seniors are the voices for the juniors, and the juniors speak for the sophomores, and the sophomores speak for the freshmen, and the freshmen speak for all those girls and boys who are waiting to get to junior high school and high school. All of you are the voices for those who will follow after you, because if you don't speak up for them, who will? You are the conscience of those who've gone before you, because we don't always remember what we needed to do and why it's important for us to do what we've done. You have an obligation for civic engagement, because you have an obligation to change your school. You have an obligation to change your neighborhood, to change your world. I mean, how many of you think that you go to school, uh, that, that you like how many days you're in school? How many of you wish you were in school more, more days? Exactly. I get to decide how many days you go to school. As a state legislator, it is my job to vote to decide if I'm going to make you go to school Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> How many, of you, how many of you wish that there was a curfew that said you had to go home and be in bed by 8 p.m.? OK. You need to look around so everybody can tell who just tried to change your, your curfew time. But Councilman C.T. Martin, who sits on the Atlanta City Council, they can decide how long you stay on the streets at night. There are people who make choices for you every day. And if we don't hear from you, we are going to choose things you don't like. And I'll tell you why, because we don't care. Now, it's not that we don't care about you. But we, we don't necessarily care about everything you care about because we're not you anymore. I'm not 17. I'm not 18. I have a driver's license, so I don't really think about whether or not you want one. I have the ability to go and buy the things I need, so I don't necessarily know if you have enough jobs to hire you when the summer comes. 
but you know these things and you understand these things and if you are not the voice, then no one will be. The choices we make, civic engagement is not about Washington, D.C. It's not even about what happens at that Capitol. It's about what happens to you. It's about what happens to your family, what happens to your brothers and your sisters, to your grandparents and your parents. Civic engagement is about the world that you choose to have. And what I'm going to talk to you about now is how you can do it. Now, I was really happy to see my water bottle because on the other side of it, it says H2 on one side, but the other side has the Avengers on it. I love superhero movies. I, I do, I love them. I think, I don't understand why they redid Superman or Spider-Man, but the rest of them I like. And I love the Avengers, although I think, I think Luke Cage should have been in the last movie. But I will tell you that I was worried about the Avengers because I saw Thor, I saw both Iron Men, I, I sat through Captain America and I don't know why. That was a bad movie. And so I was worried, and, and actually I saw only one of the Hulks because I just couldn't make myself do that again. But I was worried about the, what they were going to do with the Avengers because it's a great idea, and if you saw the trailers at the end of each of the movies, you wanted to know what was going to happen. And when I got to the audience and I was sitting there watching the movie, I got more and more excited. And I got excited because they did something I didn't think they would do. They understood that you couldn't tell each separate story that you had to tell all the stories together, but instead of talking about how wonderful each of those superheroes were, they talked about their flaws. They talked about why Iron Man was too arrogant and why the Hulk couldn't keep his temper in check. They talked about why Black Widow had you know, some, some serious issues that I think require some therapy. And they talked about why, the, why, why um, Arrow could do the work he did. They, they talked about issues and they, they talked about how to save and change the world, not by fighting about how we were different, but by how we could put our differences to use to make things better. Everyone in this room is different. Every one of you is different. Every one of you has a special skill. There are those of you who are in the math and sciences and those of you who are in law. All of you come to this place with different skills. All of you come to this world with different skills. And we can spend all of your lives fighting about why you're different, or we can figure out how to put those differences to work together to change the world. Because if you saw the Avengers, it was only when they decided that they were going to use the Hulk's anger. They were going to use the arrogance of Iron Man. They were going to use the special shield of Captain America, who I still don't really understand. But they were going to use everyone's skills to pull them together to save their world. And that's what you are called upon to do. You're called upon to take this education you are getting here today and pull your resources and pull yourselves together to change Thorough High School, to change Atlanta, to change Georgia, to change the world. Unless you're satisfied. Unless you think everything's OK, in which case you should go home and go take a nap. But if for some reason you think that things could be better, then you are the ones who have to do it. And I'm going to tell you how. First and foremost, you have to speak up. Say it with me. Say, speak up. Speak up. Okay, I didn't hear y'all. Say, speak up. Speak up. You have to talk about what you see. If you know of a child who is being abused at home, you have to speak up about it. If you think that you're not learning because a teacher's not doing her job, you have to speak up about it. If you think that there need to be you know, better toilet paper in the bathroom and better food in the lunchroom, you have to speak up about it. <laughs> Civic engagement, civic engagement is nothing harder than speaking up about the things you see and telling people what you want them to do about it. Because when one of you speaks up, they might hear you. When five of you speak up, they might pay attention. But when all of you start to speak up, when your voices come together, you are louder than anyone who wants to say no. So first you have to do what? Speak up. The second thing you have to do is stand up. It is not enough to complain. Because y'all are really good at it, so are we. Complaining is easy. All you got to do is find somebody to listen. But standing up is harder. Because it's easy to, all of you clapped, but how many of you are willing to stand up and be the first one to say it? When you were the first one, good. I'm a, I need to know your name because I'm going to come find you. <laughs> when you were willing to stand up, then you are willing to give people a place to focus. You're willing to give voice and also action to what needs to happen. Civic engagement doesn't work if all we do is whine about it. If that worked, the world would be a very different place. We'd have peace on earth, everybody would be a billionaire, and I would get to watch television 24 hours a day. But that's not how the world works. Because we, don't, we speak about it, but we don't stand up for it. Dr. Lowry stood up and changed the world. Martin Luther King stood up and changed the world. 
Janetta Cole stood up at Spelman College where I went to school and she changed how women learned in this country. Each of you has in you the ability to stand up and to speak up about an issue and to change how things happen. So first you're going to do what? And then you're going to? And the last thing I need you to do is show up. On, on November 6th, we are going to vote. How many of you, who are, how many of you are going to be 18 by November 6th? How many of you are registered to vote? Exactly. Now, if, how many of you are not registered to vote? How many of you have parents or grandparents or know somebody over the age of 18? Every one of you can vote. You may not be able to push the button, but you can vote because you need to find somebody and tell them, go speak up and stand up for me. Show up on November 6th and change my life. You need this to happen for you because if you don't, you won't have money to go to college, you're going to lose your ability to take out loans, you're not going to have jobs to go to because apparently government's going to start to trickle down, which means government's not going to get to anybody in this room. And the things that are problems are going to bubble up and overwhelm us all. If you want the world to be different on November 6th, you have to show up. Say it with me. Say show up. show up. You have to show up in the voting booth. You have to show up and say, here's what I need. Here is the decision that I'm making for my world. And it's not just voting for Barack Obama or the other guy. It is voting on everything on that ballot. It is showing up to tell the world that I want things to be different, that I take responsibility, and more importantly, I take ownership of my life. Because when you show up in the voting booth, you are hiring people to do your jobs. The city council members, the county commissioners, the school board members, and myself, we are all hired by you. How many of you buy something and pay taxes? Yeah, no, put your hand back up. If you have bought a stick of gum, you have paid taxes. You pay six to seven to eight percent on everything you purchase. If you wear clothing and you have had a summer job and had to pay for it, you pay taxes. That means your money pays for my job. And yet none of you tell me what to do. Most of you couldn't, couldn't pick me out of a lineup before today. And yet I am one of 180 people who decides how long you go to school, whether or not you get good books in your classroom, whether or not you have computers. We decide everything with your money. And if government is the only business where people hire you and then go home for two years to wait and see if you do your job, how many of you would love to have a job where someone hired you and then disappeared for two years? I would. I've got that job. I'm called the minority leader. I have a job where we hire people and we don't bother to show up. When I sit in my office and I make choices about your life, I should know who you are. So should your council members, your school board members, everyone that you hire because the minute you have purchased something and paid taxes, you have hired me to do a job. And you should show up and hold me accountable. You have to vote, but you also have to do the thing the next day. November 6th is critical, but November 7th is even more important. Because on November 6th we choose, but November 7th we live with our decisions. And we have to live with the decision of who we pick as our president, and who we pick as our council members, and who we pick as our, our state representatives. We have to live with the choices we make because we don't get to choose again for two or four years. So I need you to first do what? Speak up. I then need you to do what? Stand up. And third, I need you to what? Show up. And if you will speak up, if you will stand up and you will show up, you will change this world, and now I will shut up. Thank you. <laughs> I'm here with Dr. Lara. What message did you want the student to receive today from your speech? Civic engagement. And that's the message we want to see delivered, that the community is dependent upon the stewardship of its constituents to determine the quality of life that exists in that community. And we hope that students will learn from these experiences that it's important for them to participate that they ought to feel a responsibility to, to be active and to assume uh, responsibility for what happens in their community. The level of, of the quality of life in the community is largely determined by the level of participation uh, on the part of its citizens and constituents. So the message we hope they receive is that the community depends on their stewardship, their participation, their uh, contributions uh, to the total life of the community. Earlier in your, in your lecture, you mentioned voting. Why is voting important? Well, voting uh, has to do with 
public policy. Uh, legislators and others who hold office uh, pass laws and establish policies that, that uh, affect our lives directly. Uh, and the closer they are to us, the more directly they affect our lives. So that we are conscious of the need to hold elected officials accountable, to be aware of the various proposals that are before us uh, in our communities. And the vote is the power that the people have to hold elected officials accountable and to really determine the quality of life that exists in that community. Without the vote, you, 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 you're helpless. That's your tool by which you can build your community, your hammer and your saw and nail that build the community through voting. It's citizen participation. If you don't vote, you don't count. And we cannot uh, make our communities what they really ought to be without getting in there and participating at every level. And with our vote and with our interest, with our information, with our concern. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> so what advice would you give students in order to become more active in the community? Well, I think that is the advice, to become more active in the affairs of the community because they directly impact the lives of the students and the families. Mm -hmm. So if you don't participate, you don't have an opportunity to help mold and shape the future. Uh, if you don't vote, you don't count. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it, it's imperative that we vote. A voteless people is a helpless people, and uh, we have a we have not too good a record uh, in terms of levels of participation. And your generation has to improve on the on the stewardship of those who went before you. Uh, don't let this harvest pass. Uh, cast your vote in every election. Learn about the issues. The very important issue on the ballot now about charter schools and a constitutional amendment mm -hmm. uh, giving a small group of people in charge of our education, the future of our children. You need to know about that. People need to vote to make their concerns heard at the ballot box. That's how people uh, express their will and determine the future of the community, voting. Very important. You inspired a lot of people. Who inspired you? You did. <laughs> of course you did. Uh, I've been inspired all my life. My parents were active in the community and they inspired me. And then later on in terms of the movement, the civil rights movement, uh, Martin Luther King was a great inspiration to me in terms of the nonviolent movement that we uh, participated in to, to change the world, really. Although we weren't aware of the universal impact of the movement at the time. Uh, but, uh, uh, and I was also inspired by, by uh, people like uh, elderly people who were not able to register and vote when they were young because of discriminatory policies of government. And here are some people in their 70s and 80s coming to register to vote so they can have a voice in their community. That's extremely inspirational to me, as is the participation of young people uh, to help shape the future for themselves. That's inspiring. I'm Brittany Brinkley. And I'm David Kane. Thank, Thank you, you for, for joining us for this edition of Inside APS. APS.